This morning I am reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26, beginning in the 36th verse. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to the disciples, stay here while I go and pray over there. When he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, he began to feel sad and anxious. Then he said to them, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert with me. Then he went a short distance further and fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. Then he came back to the disciples and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, couldn't you stay alert one hour with me? Stay alert and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. A second time he went away and prayed. My father, if it's not possible that this cup be taken away unless I drink it, then let it be what you want. And again, he came and found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy with sleep, but he left them and again went and prayed the same words for the third time. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Will you sleep and rest all night? Look, the time has come for the human one to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, for here comes my betrayer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? In these moments, O oh God, wherever we find ourselves, we ask you to visit us so that you will give us not only the eyes to see, but also the ears to hear what your word is trying to teach us this day. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In just a couple of months, I will celebrate my 40th anniversary under pastoral appointment in the United Methodist Church. Prior to my first appointment, I spent eight additional years serving as a minister of music. Now, what that means practically is that for 48 years, I have read and studied the Passion story annually in preparation for worship planning, preaching, or teaching. As familiar as I am with the Passion story, I saw something in the story this year that I have never paid attention to before. In the privacy of my study, when I read scripture, I generally read out loud so that I can hear the rhythm of the text, allowing the words to penetrate my mind through hearing as well as seeing. It makes a huge difference in how I receive and process and understand the scriptures. I don't know how I've missed it before, but I heard personal emotion shared by Jesus that I have previously overlooked. It has been this year like hearing the passion story for the very first time. Now, to make sure that I wasn't making something out of nothing, I cross-referenced Matthew's story of an intense prayer time in the Garden of Gethsemane with the Gospel according to Mark and then on to Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. Most scholars agree that Mark was the first Gospel written. There seems to be evidence that both Matthew and Luke used Mark as a reference in writing their Gospels. 
What I read to you just a moment ago from Matthew 26 is almost identical to Mark's version of the story. If you wish to look it up, you can find it in Mark chapter 14, verses 32 and following. Mark's feeling words were perhaps a bit more poignant than Matthew. Mark said that Jesus felt despair. He was anxious. Mark's record of the event had Jesus saying to Peter, James, and John, I'm very sad. It's as if I'm dying. If a psychiatrist, psychologist, or physician were to hear that phrasing as a diagnostic process, they would probably explore the possibility that Jesus was experiencing a panic attack. Well, clearly, Jesus had reason to be concerned and fearful. With keen insight and foresight, Jesus knew what was ahead for him. In the mystical divinity of Jesus, he had the ability to see what the others could not see. And in that moment of extraordinary self-awareness, Jesus was able to precisely name the grip of grief that he felt. He could identify the feelings of despair, anxiety, sadness that were all overwhelming to him. Luke's version was similar. It was phrased a little differently. We find Luke's story in chapter 22, verse 39 and following. Luke wrote about the prayer of Jesus this way. Father, if it is your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not my will, but your will be done. Then Luke tells us an angel appeared to strengthen Jesus. But then Luke goes on. He was in anguish and prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. Now I want you to pause just a moment, will you? Sit with those descriptive words of those images of Jesus. Now, as you ponder those descriptions, can you feel the emotions of Jesus from the description given by the three biblical storytellers? Can you remember feelings that you have had as you have lived through times of anguish, distress, grief, sadness, or anxiety? Can you overlay your feelings with the feelings of Jesus in Gethsemane? You see, friends, you and I are experiencing Holy Week of 2020 from a very different perspective than anything we have ever known in our lifetime. We are in Gethsemane. We can relate with the feelings that Jesus had in the garden. And conversely, Jesus is relating to the confusion and the anguish that we are feeling just now. Because of our circumstances as a result of the COVID-19 virus, we've all been thrust into waves of emotion. We are experiencing feelings of sadness and anxiety. We have concerns and we have worries. We are dealing with grief and despair. Maybe that's why those feeling words of Jesus leapt out to me as I read the text this year. Maybe my personal vulnerability is different than it's been in past Lenten seasons. Maybe we all can identify with Jesus in Gethsemane in a way that we could not relate before. Let's be honest. 
every day, every day for the last three to five weeks has been emotionally draining for us. And it does not appear that the end is in sight yet. In fact, experts tell us that our situation may actually get worse before it gets better. It's heartbreaking to listen and attempt to process the magnitude of the suffering from illness and death. Because with every illness and every death, the tentacles of the number of people affected by sadness and grief and anxiety is beyond our ability to fully grasp. Add to that the enormous risk involved by medical professionals as they do their work without appropriate tools to protect their health as well as the health of their families and their colleagues. Plus, we are frustrated by the various voices that are advising and interpreting our crisis. And it seems that all of them have just a little different perspective. So when we try to take it all in, there is a weight that we feel, a weight of care and concern and frustration that we are carrying, and it is immense. It's difficult to maintain some sense of distance or balance when every day we are hearing and processing and responding and attempting to filter the news so that each of us can make responsible decisions for our own welfare. We all know it. It's so easy to become overwhelmed. None of us have chosen to experience life in Gethsemane this Holy Week. On Ash Wednesday, a mere six weeks ago, none of us had any plans to be in Gethsemane on Palm Sunday. We would much rather be in our sanctuary waving palm branches and remembering the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But there are times in life when expectations do not materialize and we must adjust to a new kind of reality. Truth is, we are in Gethsemane. Now what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with our reality? It's been nearly 25 years ago when in a downsizing cost cutting decision, I was let go from a job that I loved. I had no warning, except that it was happening in every department within the hospital. But as the senior chaplain with a staff, I didn't expect it to be me. Being blindsided, I was crushed. After a few weeks, a good friend called and invited me out for lunch. He did not join my self-pity party. Instead, he asked some very direct questions. I remember his questions as though they were spoken to me this morning. He said, how are you going to turn your tragedy into a triumph? How are you going to take advantage of this precious time that you've been given to be on an unexpected personal retreat? What do you need to learn? How do you need to grow? What do you need to do now to prepare for your next chapter? Those are important questions for Gethsemane. Certainly, they are not the only questions that we should consider, but what are we going to do with this time that all of us have been given? Maybe we all need to step back a little, to reassess, to rethink and pray, to plan and study, to catch up, to ca connect and reconnect with God and our faith and ourselves and significant people in, lot, in our lives. In Gethsemane, there might be a lesson that Jesus is attempting to teach us. And maybe, just 
maybe it all begins with naming the emotions. Because you see, out of the sadness and anxiety, out of disappointment and depression, out of anguish and suffering, came Easter. In our Gethsemane, perhaps there are lessons that we need to learn. And perhaps one of those lessons is taken from the book of Hebrews, where the author wrote, consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, who for the joy set before him, even endured the cross. I wonder, can we learn something? Can we be grateful for Gethsemane? Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for being with us on this Palm Sunday morning. We trust that God has spoken to you through something that has been said or done, through a song that we have sung, through a reading, through the scriptures. And from Gethsemane, from Gethsemane, we go out into our world to take the good news of the gospel. And I leave you with the portion from the Book of Common Prayer that I shared with you last week. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen.